Okay, before I get too deep into this, anybody want to man that camera? Because I like to move around. <laughs> Do we have a volunteer? <laughs> Who will be enlisted as a volunteer? All right, we have a volunteer. Amen. Can everybody hear me, or do I need to move this up closer to me? Mm -hmm. You're good. All right, good. Uh, we have good volume. Uh, we have yes. a camera person. Thank you for filling in for Brother Charlie. Uh, I not know where we're going to start. We're going to start in Psalm 33 this evening. We're going to be looking at a number of different verses. I am going to move this up a little bit. I've entitled this message, One Nation Under God. What are more... What couldn't be a more appropriate title than four, uh, certainly four of my favorite words in the Pledge of Allegiance? A little history on the Pledge of Allegiance it was first started in the late 1800s, but until about 1950 or so, the words One Nation Under God was not in our original Pledge of Allegiance. That was started by um, a representative in the state of Michigan and later signed into law on Flag Day by, President, by then President Eisenhower. And it, so the whole Pledge of Allegiance now includes the phrase, under God. And I thought for myself, and this is kind of an adaptation for me, I preached a number of years back, back when I was in, the Mass in Massachusetts, I preached in a number of dis different nursing homes throughout the years that I was up there. And in those nursing homes, every time we would have a come up to kind of an Americanist, an Americanized holiday, whether it be Memorial Day or Fourth of July, I would usually bust out a couple of, couple of Amer uh, themed verses that would be, that would set this kind of a context. What I'm going to look at tonight is I want us to see, are we really one nation under God? As individuals, as Americans, whatever country you're from, are we under God? I want to find that in our keynote verse here. I'm going to turn there myself. I want to read it, and then we're going to pray. So Psalm 33, and I'm going to be in verse 12. It's the only verse we're going to look at in Psalm 33, by the way. Here the Bible says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. That's right. Father, we just are indeed thankful for the opportunity to be in your word this evening. And Lord, as you graciously allowed this great country that we live in to last another year, Lord, may this ever be a year, this country decide, if this country ever is going to turn back to you, Lord, let it be now. Let it be now that this country would st already start be making the progress toward repentance and restoration to you. Not because we know what's in the future, but because you hold the future, because you allow this great country to, to start, and because many of its precepts are founded in thy word. Lord, I just... I pray that this nation would, would seek you again. But most importantly, Lord, that as believers, we would seek you. Help us to see through your word tonight that we need to be under God, regardless of our citizenship, regardless of what lot we hold in life, Lord, may you get all the honor and glory. Help me to speak your word. And I just thank you for the opportunity to hear from you. I ask now in Jesus' name. Amen. So, is America's God currently the God of the Bible? Or would it happen to be one of those lowercase gods? I'd like to take a brief look at American history and that American history, actually, has deep roots in many biblical precepts. Now, I've written most of my notes out, so if I happen to look down, it's because I've written everything out. Some people use an outline for their notes. Some people don't even need notes at all. No. My notes are like, a tel it's like, reading, a t it's like reading off a teleprompter, except I've handwritten them down, 
and my handwriting is similar to that of, of the old Egyptian hieroglyphics. So sometimes it's hard for me to read my own handwriting, let alone try to speak. So if I'm pausing or stuttering for a second, it's more than likely the fact that I can't read my own handwriting. Also, I want to know that American, so in getting started this evening, I want to see that many good men and women have died for the purpose of wanting freedom to practice religion without fear of retaliation. In fact, that's how many of those seeking religious freedom began. Many of those who sought this freedom were Christians and left that tradition with our country's patriarchs, who in turn, many of them were born again, and even those that weren't had, had at least some sense of right and wrong, had more sense of right and wrong than unfortunately many in, our, many in, in power do today. Prayers were offered in public schools. The Ten Commandments were proudly etched in stone in many places. They used to be in public lawns, outside of courthouses. Lots of public places had the Ten, had the, had the Ten Commandments etched in stone and proudly for display as a testament to God and as a testament to what this country was founded on. Many precepts. However, those precepts have only gotten this country and Americans so far. America started to slide away from God and away from doing right faster and faster. Not only as time went on, but as we, got, as we turned the clock into the 20th century. By the middle of the 20th century, many other things started to draw the attention of Americans away from the church house, away from the word of God, things including but not such limited to television, Hollywood, sports, other things, started slowly and slower drawing more attention away from being in the word of God, being in the house of the Lord, being in prayer. And the crevasse of sin opened wider and wider. When the inf two, fur two infamous court cases in the mid-1900s furthered such events, furthered this deepening crevasse of sin and further taking America down the wrong path, you know the two cases I'm referring to. Brown versus Board of Education, which allowed for the opening of such things as, as taking the Bible out of our schools, stopping prayer time. These things were in American schools, even in the, what, 1950s, 1960s, and maybe in some, maybe in some uh, places in the country a little bit later than that, but not much later. That allowed the removal of the Bible, Bible and prayer time out of many of the public schools. Many schools today forbid students to even show a copy, not just have a copy, but to show a copy of the Word of God. Last I checked, this was not a socialist country. It's becoming one. Last I checked, it wasn't. Teachers stopped teaching a literal six-day creation, as explained clearly in Scripture, and started teaching that humanity evolved from monkeys. Furthermore, in addition to Brown versus Board of Education, about 15 years or so later, you have Roe v. Wade. This opened the door for the, un for the, for the abortion of unwanted children. While in some areas this may be frowned upon, in many, many others 
It is not. And we know from Scripture that these acts grieve a thrice holy God. So while America as a country has become a very wicked and very ungodly people, how do the people of God fare? We too, myself included, have become too busy for God in our own lives. Sin doesn't always just jump right out at you. It can start as something very small, maybe even unrecognizable if you're not paying attention. It's just like a fire. It's just like starting a fire. One little spark, you can set the whole night ablaze if you want. Sin works the same way. One little sin is all it takes, Christian. And before you know it, unconfessed sin just grows and grows and grows even further. And before you realize it, and before you possibly even turn around, there's a whole mess behind. Not many people know more examples of that than myself. I've been there. How can I speak of such experiences? Because I've been down that road. Many times, leaving sin unchecked. I get too busy for God. It happens to me. It, ha it can happen to you. We oft forget to pray. We claim we are too tired to read the Word of God. Our conversations start to sound more like the lost around, around us and not what we have been redeemed and set free from. So tonight I'd like to look at a few verses given to those in Israel and written for our examples that we can apply in our own lives and perhaps may help our country. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 29. I'll read verse 2 in a second. Give everybody a quick chance to get over there. Proverbs 29, 2. Here the Bible says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. I'll repeat that one more time. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked heareth, beareth rule, the people mourn. We saw often throughout Scripture that when a judge who did right was in control, all was well with the people of God. Judges is replete with many of those examples. But yet when a wicked king had power, the people mourned. Yet, yet however, by the time we get into the later kings, we start to see a little bit of this reversal. Yet many didn't mourn a wicked king by the time of Ahab among other when the time of Ahab among others took reign. We would start to see this verse be flipped as such. To where when a righteous king ruled, the people wanted nothing to do with righteousness. And when a wicked king was in was in charge, the people would rejoice. I'm going to use this example. It would not take any person more than about five minutes, if that, on any social media, mainstream media platform today to see this in such example. Hear how the people cheer for things that are evil and mourn when somebody tried to do right. I don't need to go into deep detail this evening. But any, any, spend five minutes, even that, on any mainstream media platform, whatever channel you like, whatever 
political side you like. Spend five minutes and you'll find exactly what I'm talking about. It's complete opposite of Proverbs 29.2 is what's being talked about. They would rather cheer and do things that are evil and abhorrent in the sight of God than seek to do right for a second in their lives. You know what's funny? I'm on the mainstream medias a lot. I'm on Facebook way more than I'd like to admit. And I see all the time these good deeds that are being done and they're being hailed for it. I'm like to myself, wait a second. If they grew up in 1993, America, like I did, we didn't get any kind of special rewards for that. It's what we were supposed to do. You found a hundred bucks on the sidewalk, you turned it in. If you saw the person drop it in front of the person in front of you, drop it off. You pick it up and hand it to them. You don't deserve a medal for that. If you found big amount of money somewhere else. You turned it into the police station. Why are we hailing kids for... We should be hailing kids for... Kids should be doing right. Don't get me wrong. But it doesn't mean they need to get 10,000 likes on Facebook. The point is... Is that... We need this verse to be true again. And it will be one day. Because what's going to happen in the millennial reign? Christ is going to be in authority. And the people in heaven are going to be rejoicing. It will happen again someday. And I can't wait. Hope you can't either. <laughs> Christians today need to rejoice no matter what circumstance may come. Let's remember that our hope is in God. And God is in heaven. Our hope is not in Washington or Tallahassee. <laughs> Second verse I'd like to look at, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 14. Okay. Proverbs 14, and I'd like to read verse 34. I'm, I'm perhaps I'm sure a lot of you are pretty familiar with this verse. Okay. Here the Bible says, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Doing right in our own lives is a testimony to a lost and dying world around us. Perhaps even we can reach out to those who represent our constituency. Like I said, not that our hope needs to be in Washington or in Bra or or to the or to the uh, or to the um, to the representatives of Oakland Park. But our hope needs to be in the Lord. We need to pray for our leaders at all levels. Not only that we can live peaceably, but that they would seek to do right. Hold your finger in Proverbs 14 and turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 I'll start in verse 1. The Bible says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Note verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? That's very that's a very important verse. You can turn back to Proverbs chapter 14 if you so desire. Even in a society that is seemingly more and more hostile to God, many religious freedoms still exist today, and we must use all of them to honor God. But even if none of them existed, even if we didn't have a single religious freedom that this country enjoys today, 
we're still free to worship. We're, we can still worship God. Many in, for, many in foreign countries are jailed for worshiping God. There are underground churches probably meeting at this hour in, thir in other countries because they don't have the same religious freedoms that Americans enjoy or those that live here enjoy. While it's sad for them, we can enjoy the freedom to sit, to sit here and be under the word of God tonight and hear great Bible preaching. But while others cannot, we must take this and we must take advantage of this opportunity to hear from God. God, though, wants all men to be saved. Wouldn't it be great for many of our leaders to publicly confess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Perhaps it does turn this nation around. But even if it doesn't, we must remember that God would still have them, God would still have them to repent and to come to Jesus, regardless of whether or not this nation turns around. He, remember that he is not willing that any, whether they be good in their own eyes or as wicked as can be, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. However, as we see the second half of this verse, while righteousness does exceed, indeed exalt a nation, we also see sin is a reproach to any people. Remember that if there's sin in our lives, our prayers cannot be heard. I believe there was a psalmist that said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Psalm 66, 18. God cannot bless a life filled with sin. He shows great mercy and great grace to the wicked and to those who have fallen away from him. But we should desire to not be a reproach. Because of what Jesus did, we have the choice to do right. And God, help us to do right. As we desire... Give us the desire to do right. Help us to do right. I desire to do right. Help me to do right, God. It's because I want to do it. I want to please you in my life. I don't want to serve man anymore in my life. God put me here. I was born to serve the Lord. I was not born to serve Satan. Unfortunately, I spent many years serving Satan. I spent 23 years before Christ serving Satan. And even I, to my shame, I spent years claiming to be a Christian and not serving God. If you're not serving God, it's the other way around. You're wasting your life if you're not serving God. God, help us to do right. Help us to not be a reproach to any people. Third verse I'd like us to see this evening. Turn with me to Ezra chapter 9. This was the uh, verse I quoted in the on the Sunday evening scripture challenge. Ezra chapter 9 and verse 10. Now we're going to be breaking into the context here. So I'm actually going to start reading in verse 1 because I want us to get a little bit of the context here. Um, Ezra is a ready scribe who is also a priest and he's leading a group of the Israelites. This is a couple of years removed after the exile and the first original group led by Nehemiah had gone back to Jerusalem after the 70 year exile. And we see that even just a short time after they're back, that these people are falling into great sin again. I'll start reading in verse 1 of Ezra chapter 9. Now when these things were done, the princes came to me, this would be Ezra writing in first person, saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations either the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken other daughters for themselves and for their sons, 
so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands, yea, the hand of the princes and rulers hath been chief in this trespass. Basically what he's saying is that the people of God were having relations with those who were without, those who were pagan. Verse 3, And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mail, and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard, and sat down astonished. Take me a while to pluck off all the hair on my head and my beard right now. <laughs> then were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose up from my heaviness. And having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread my, out my hands unto the Lord my God and said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God. For our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up unto the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day. And for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the land to the sword, to captivity, and to a spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. And now for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God, to leave us a remnant to escape, and to give us a nail in his holy place, that our God may lighten our eyes, and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolations thereof and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. Now the keynote verse. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments. Israel had not separated themselves from the people of the land. And they had, married, they had many who had married pagan idol worshippers, which was forbidden by Mosaic law in Deuteronomy chapter 7. This caused great grief on the part of Ezra. We saw in verse 3 how he rent his clothes, he rent his mantle, practically shaved himself bald and clean. And he sat down. He was astonished. He could not believe how far the people of God, those who had called on God's very name, those who were called by God and separated for a purpose, had separated themselves onto the people they should not have had anything to do with. He confessed the iniquities of the land, and he included himself in such, in such as verses 6 through 9. Even though he had not personally committed in this transgression, he shared in the iniquities of his people. In so doing, he took Daniel's example in Daniel chapter 9, when he confessed himself as one amongst those in the exile. That's Daniel 9, 5 through 19. Good reading on your own time, perhaps. Ezra then remarked in our text, And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? It's a hypothetical question. Did the people have any such excuse to fall into such great sin? No. Absolutely not. Do we, as God's people, have any such excuse when we fall into great sin? No. No. We don't. We don't have the same excuse. I can't go before a thrice holy God and say, and, and remark that I wanted to live right, but at the same time, I saw wicked pictures on the social media. I can't do that. Am I, with, I don't have an excuse before God. When I fall, neither does anybody else. Neither do the people of Israel here. We 
too are without excuse for our sin as a failure and, and, and a failure, both as individuals and as and as Americans. This country does not have an excuse. We should identify with our fellow Americans in acknowledging that we have forsaken God's commandments. We should strive. We should grieve. I'm sorry. We should grieve. It says strive here, but again, I told you my, my handwriting is similar to that of Egyptian hieroglyphics. We should grieve at how far we have fallen as a man away from God. There's one more verse I'd like to look at, and this is a great promise that even though it doesn't completely apply to us, there are things in this verse that we can apply, and that's 2 Chronicles 7.14. I trust many of you are familiar with this verse too. 2 Chronicles 7.14. Great verse. I, like, I wish I committed this to my memory. I'm going to start working on it. Maybe Taj will give me two miles for this verse. Here the Bible says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. While this indeed is a very specific promise made to the nation of Israel, which was indeed fulfilled, that God's people did indeed repent, and go back to, and go back to him, and God did indeed hear from, hear from heaven, forgiven their sins, healed their land, time and time again, and while we may not know what the future is in store for America, we do see here that there are great promises. As Christians, we are God's people. We are called from we are called by God to stand for Him. We can get right in our own lives at any time. We don't need to go to a, we don't need to go to the nearest confessional to get right with God. We don't need to go praying to an idol to get right with God. We can get on our knees. If your knees aren't good like mine, you bow your head. You say, and you, and you pray, God forgive me of my sin. He'll forgive you. Your child of his, he'll forgive you. Take first John, first John 1 9, deposit that right in the bank. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a great and precious promise. Does that still give you license to do wrong? No. But that does mean when you do sin, you can go to God and you can get right. And you can be restored into fellowship. You can get right in your own life at any time. Just humble yourself, pray, confess your sin. God will hear from heaven and will forgive your sin. Then seek to turn no longer to sin, but turning to do right. Because that's what sin involves. That's what, that's what repentance involves. A changing of the mind into thinking, in the, in the sin thinking, it's a, this is all right, to no. This is not right. Something wrong is not right. Two wrongs don't make a right. Three wrongs don't make a right. But turning from it, realizing it is sin, to doing right, that's what repentance is all about. That is the concept we need to get across. Will God heal America? He can choose to. And I believe he would, if this country turned back to him, earnestly back toward him. We don't know for sure what God is going to hold for this country, but we do know, and it, doesn't, it does not mean, just because we don't know what God's future is for this great country, which turned 242 today, just because we don't know what God has in store for this country doesn't eradicate our responsibility to this great country. This doesn't eradicate the fact that we need to pray for this country. 
It doesn't eradicate the fact that we need to pray for our leaders on every level. This doesn't eradicate the fact that we need to pray for our fellow citizens and for even those who don't have citizenship that are here in this country, and even for the world, of course. This does not eradicate that responsibility. And ultimately, this, country, this country's hands is in, God, is in God's hands. If you're legally able to, vote for those who would seek to do right. Be active and show others by your witness and by your testimony that they need God in their lives. So I'd like to conclude with this. While some recent events under the current administration we're in seem to indicate potentially the turning of the tide from, doing, from years of doing wrong and falling further and further and further away from God, while current events have seemed to kind of stem that tide and possibly push us back, as an, either as a people or as a nation, back to where we were years ago, years ago and even centuries ago, that does not mean America completely turns back. This next election is going to be the most important election in this country's history, in my opinion. But we must also remember that not even the most righteous leaders of nations, such as Josiah, could not stop the fall of Judah, which happened after his time. Not even great godly King Josiah, just a mere few generations after his leadership, Judah was captured by Nebuchadnezzar in 587 BC. While there is still time, as long as God lets us, while the slogan utilized by President Trump and the Republican Party of Make America Great Again sounds catchy, sounds great, I got one that's a little better. How about we make America godly again? How about we seek to do right in our own lives? Let's make Andrew godly again. Let's make, insert your name, godly again. Be grateful for those who have written a check of any amount up to and including a blank check to, to the United States of America. And for those who are, who are alive and have served or who are serving in our various forms of military and, and um, oversee and that, that sense. Let's be grateful for them. Let's be grateful for what God has done in our lives. And if you're in, tonight, if you're in a place of needing repentance, tonight's what better, what better time than to get right with God than right now? If you're not sure you're born again, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today is the day to get right. Right now is the time to get right. Don't go walking out that door thinking you're still going to have time to get right. Because not, not, you're, not you're not guaranteed that time. If you're going to get right with God, now is the time to do it. You're not guaranteed when you walk out that door. And I'm not saying that to scare you tonight. I'm saying that because the urgency to live for God is now. I'm saying that because the urgency for us. God's working in our hearts. God's working in our lives. God's gonna, God can work in this country. But while today is a great time to remember our country, and every day is a great day to remember God and what God has done for us. Remember what the psalmist said when he said, Will not thou revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Psalm 85, 6. Remember America. Rejoice in the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to, to look in your word. 
Lord, we don't know what the future holds for this great country, but Lord, we must remember that our hope is not in Washington, D.C. Our hope is not in Tallahassee. Our hope is not in Fort Lauderdale. Our hope is not in Oakland Park, but our hope is in you. Our hope is in Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. And Lord, I just pray you would help all of us to, to live for you in these days that we may see good things done, but not because of what we've done, but because of you and what you allow. Lord, just please work in our hearts and our lives. Thank you for your word, and thank you for this country we live in, and we can, and we can worship here tonight. Thank you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Professor? Thank you. Thank you for uh, speaking to us tonight, Andrew. And uh, let's go ahead and take prayer requests at this time. We see Julio and Sylvia back. We prayed for you. And they've had quite a few uh, ins and outs health-wise. and uh, But they're here. And it's nice to see you guys uh, that you're with us. Do you have anything you want to share by way of prayer request this evening? Yes, Shamir? Um... Well, this is about my car. Okay. And what I should do with it. All right. What's wrong with the car? My dad says I should sell it, and I was like, I don't want to, because it's leaking all over the place. One of the main reasons why I came late. Okay. All right, so pray Shamir knows what to do about his car. He wanted it, now he's got it, and still wants it. And, um, it's, you know, just... Making the right, just making the decision God wants, with God's best for it. So, okay. Yes, Mark. Pray for Q. Whoever that is. Say it again. Pray for Q. Whoever Q. that is. Who's Q? I look it up. He says read the Bible. <laughs> What's that? He says read the Bible so you can believe him. If you don't know, he's a, a group or a, a somebody who is letting out uh, what's going on, which what we're seeing unfolding in this country. I sent you a little video. I don't have a chance to look at it. I, I watched the video, but yeah. I guess well, I can catch it's, the... It's, uh, it's, it's somebody who's, or a group of people, who's very close to President Trump, who's posting okay. what's going on in the background, and they're taking down the deep state. Uh -huh. you, you, you have to kind of experience it to understand it, but whoever that is, uh, they're a lot right. close, they said, reading the Bible, so, I mean, amongst other things, you're <laughs> Yeah, people. okay. All right, yeah, pray for... You know, there are a number of people, actually, um, so it's actually actually pretty surprising in our, in our nation right now. I just um, heard Chuck Hardy preach a couple weeks ago, and he started Capital Connection, which is a group of uh, believers that just go to the Capitol once a year, and they go into all the senators' offices and all the uh, different places and actually just pray with our, with our leaders in our country. One of the things they've said is what is astonishing is how accessible people that you wouldn't think you could get in touch with actually are. A comedian just called the president, got the president to call him back. What, last week was that? On the, from, from Air Force One. And uh, literally, um, they've been having Bible study with Mike Pence. And there's, there's, for the first time, there's Bible study in the White House actually going on in our nation. Absolutely. For the first time. That, and that, I, I, I can't remember if the president has attended. I know he's for the Bible study. Mike Pence has attended Bible study. There are a lot of things that are going on. Like like uh, Mark said, there's a lot of things. There's 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 a lot of people that have been instilled in the deep state in our country. Just people put into positions where you're not elected, but you have unchecked power. And uh, but pray. I'm sorry. What's that? I said you can't. You can't. If you're just going to your traditional media sources, you're not. Getting anything that lies. Well, I, yeah, I think uh, that's and, been that way and, for and last year. <laughs> the point is that there's patriots out there that are doing independent news reporting. Yeah. That there's a lot of very encouraging news. There is. Uh, yeah, there is. you're not going to hear it. Yeah. Kind of no, there is. And, and like I was saying, Chuck Hardy was saying the exact same thing. He said he's been into some Bible study. He said he's gotten to meet with the president a couple of times, pray with him. And I'm trying to remember the name of uh, a, a preacher. I think it was um, Robert Jeffress. Uh, who's from the Southern Baptist Church in Dallas. He's a pretty solid guy. And uh, Robert Jeffress, supposedly President Trump, prayed to be saved with him uh, this this past year. And so there's a lot of just things that, you know, our president, I'll tell you, when he was running for president, he's probably one of the most 
wicked people morally and personally. And I just thought, oh my goodness. You know, he is not he is not what you'd expect. Yeah, go ahead. It was part of the plan. <laughs> His plan goes back when Kennedy was first killed. When Kennedy was killed back in the 63, this plan that we're seeing unfold behind everybody's eyes, unless you're looking for it, was started. Well, we're taking back this country. Yeah. Well, I'm sure, that, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of things that are, that are, uh, that are happening. And, you know, the thing is, the Bible says the king's heart's in the hand of the Lord. Right. So rivers of water, he moving the withers so every will. Man can plan. But if God says, this is what's going to happen, it's just astonishing. It really is what God can do. So, all right. Uh, who else? Who else? Lee? Angela will be traveling back on Saturday. Okay, pray for Angela. They went to see Grandma and Grandpa, and Luke and Emily are going to be gone for a month. So, this is their summer of travel. So, pray for Lee's family uh, traveling back as well as the kids traveling with Grandma and Grandpa. Man, that would be something. Again, travel your grandparents in a motorhome across the U.S. That'd be a lot of fun. So that'd be great. Uh, who else tonight? A lot of silence. Pray for the folks that we met on visitation on Tuesday. Had a good, uh, good lot of visits. It's always um, encouraging to me when I go visiting. How on a block? This just, just cover one block myself. How that I meet people that are divine appointments, you know, and you just know it every time that God leads you to people that need to hear the gospel. So we have a number of folks that we're praying for for salvation. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight, and uh, like Mark mentioned, let's pray for our country as well. God, I do pray uh, for individuals, Lord, that are in dangerous places and they're serving, and their desire is to expose error, Lord. It'd be good. We'd like to have a, a nation uh, that's for the people, by the people, representative like it, it ought to be. We don't even need that. We know that in Romans, Paul wrote to that church that they should be subject to the powers and that the powers, there's no power that's not of God. And we recognize this evening the grand privilege that we have of being in a nation is very, very unique. And the way that we're meeting this evening, individuals that would hate us or not agree with us don't have the right to stop us from worshiping you. What a privilege it is. God, I pray that you would help us to exercise our privilege and our freedom. Thank you for the help, for answering our prayer, uh, for Julio and Sylvia as they've been through a lot of medical problems, Lord, but also that you gave them safety traveling here. And I just ask that you would meet their needs and keep them safe. And to Father, I just pray for their spiritual needs as well. God, I pray for uh, I pray for the Riffle family as they travel this coming up week, and I ask for your protection for them. Lord, I pray for this ministry as we look toward our teen revival services coming up next month. I just pray that you would prepare the hearts of our young people. When I think of Shamir's prayer request, he needs to know what to do. And uh, God sometimes sometimes just making decisions uh, can be very, very difficult and knowing what's right uh, out of all the decisions that he can make. So I, I ask God that you would help him make the right decision about his car and that you would, when he makes a decision, instantly with that, give him the peace to know that you're going to provide what you want for him. Now, Father, I just thank you so much for this day that we've had, for the times that we've enjoyed, the fellowship we've had together. And I ask you to bless us and keep us safe as we go our separate ways this evening. And Lord, we just thank you so much for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.